So one of the more interesting and most popular aircraft here in the collection of the P. Marin Space Museum is sitting behind me. It's Convair B-36 Peacemaker, and this is serial number 522827. The Peacemaker is one of these transitional aircraft that really spans World War II into the modern jet and nuclear age. Um, this particular aircraft is notable as being the last of 383 of them built. It was the last one into service in uh, 1954, August 1954, and it only served for five years before retiring um, to Fort Worth in February 12, 1959, making it the last produced, the last out of service, and the last operational flight of a B-36 ever. So. It came to the P. Marin Space Museum in the summer of 2005. Uh, it had been in Fort Worth uh, for 40 years at that point. Unfortunately, you know, as dedicated as the community was, they were never able to fully get around a permanent home for it. So it had been dismantled and relocated around the community several times. So, you know, we are fortunate to have it here because of the efforts of all the guys in Fort Worth over 40 years who are dedicated to preserving it. And uh, ultimately we, be we benefited from their efforts. So you imagine Fort Worth and Tucson, there's a little bit of distance between us. So how did we get it here? You know, it didn't fly. In the 1960s, uh, there was initially some effort by the group out there to uh, resurrect it for flight, and they started running engines, actually. Um, the Air Force caught wind of it and put a stop to it rather quickly, came and removed all the engines and disabled systems, so it really was never going to be able to fly again. I'd mentioned it had been dismantled several times and moved within the Fort Worth area. And when we took up the loan from the Air Force Museum in, the, in 2005, uh, myself and my, my team of restoration people and our rigging and trucking contractor uh, set out to Fort Worth in the summer. And fortunately, most of it was already disassembled, jigged and cradled. So we were able to move most of the airplane in 13 loads over several weeks out of Fort Worth. The biggest challenge we had was moving the wing center section. And uh, that ultimately came in one piece, the wing center section was 148 feet long, 29 feet wide, and 14 feet tall. It almost couldn't make it. The maximum allowable road width load is 29 feet. So we had six inches clearance on each side of the airplane. Um, so our, our trucking contractor and rigging company, Southwest Industrial Rigging, in late summer 2005, took a straight shot down the I-10 from Fort Worth to here. It took them three days at 50 miles an hour, and they arrived. And then our next task of um, completing some restoration, some corrosion control, and reassembling the airplane began. Uh, it took us 18 months to put back together, paint and put on display. It went out display here in the summer of 2008. At 16 years later, and if you're watching this on video, you'll see that being outside for 16 years uh, takes its toll on uh, paint and coatings. So it's due for refurbishment, hopefully in the next year or two here. There's one or two large birds ahead of it, but it's definitely on the schedule for some TLC. You know, we certainly benefit with our relationship with our loan partners and the U.S. Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio is one of our strongest and uh, it's, this airplane is here as a result of them. It continues to be a crowd favorite. It's unique as being the largest propeller-driven aircraft the U.S. Air Force ever operated. It's unique from the standpoint of it has six engines in reverse thrust pushing. Um, you know, the old uh, gag was uh, six turning and four burning. And most of the engineers I've talked to said we never landed with as many engines as we took off with. It was originally designed during the Second World War with the intention that it would be an intercontinental bomber in the event that England was knocked out of the war and we needed to prosecute a strategic bombing campaign from the uh, continental United States. Well, that never happened, but it took many, many years of development to get this airplane suitable for service. So when it finally did go into service, I mean, the B-47s had already beaten it to service, the B-52s were on the drawing board, so it was really a stopgap strategic uh, nuclear deterrent in that time frame. B-36s were loved by their crews and hated by their maintainers. <laughs> <laughs> it carried one of the largest nuclear, airborne nuclear weapons ever developed, the Mark 48 bomb, which, uh, oh, off the top of my head, I think it was close to 50,000 pounds in volume. One of the, the better stories I, I was told by one of the, uh, the B-36 crew members who came through here is one of the uh, Navigator bombers. And they were on an exercise and were flying their, their circuit with their, their nuclear load. 
And as they were descending over the Rocky Mountains for their descent into the Fort Worth area, uh, somewhere over southern um, Colorado, they heard a giant thump, the airplane lurched up. Um, the bomb had let itself go. And so they landed and there was a bit of a crisis and uh, the, uh, the MPs and everybody came out and the uh, navigator was uh, placed under, you know, detainment and su surveillance so they could figure out what it went on. And it was kind of a mystery until one of the uh, engineers from Convert came out and was evaluating what had happened. So it turns out, as I was told, the airplane had gone in for some deep maintenance and had been re-rigged with its, with its cabling. Well, the riggers had not followed the requirements of the aircraft. So with the size of the aircraft, the altitude it operated with, and the different environmental conditions, there's actually a phenomenal amount of expansion and contraction that goes on in these airplanes. They grow and shrink as they fly and come, so which is why you see rippling in the magnesium skins on a lot of these aircraft. Um, so what had happened is a lot of the control lines in the aircraft were rigged without enough slack in them. So as the airplane descended from altitude and started to expand again, the bomb release mechanism cable was too short and it triggered itself and released the, the bomb from the bomb base. Now the bomb wasn't armed or anything, it, it was just purely a, um, a ballast at that point as it fell, but uh, it caused a lot, of, uh, a lot of sleepless nights for a lot of people, then ultimately the navigator bombardier was was exonerated and uh, uh, the aircraft was re-rigged and served faithfully until its retirement. You know, every airplane here has has stories associated with it. Some we're aware of, some we don't know. Um, some we take on face value as being true and others probably were perpetrating a bit of a myth. But uh, anyway, uh, if you ever get a chance to come out here, take some time and uh, walk around the B-36 and take in, you know, its scale and spectacle. And uh, it's, one of, it's one of our favorites. To find out what's going on at the Pima Air and Space Museum, please visit www.pimaair.org.